All right, all right. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. We are uh, we are free today. We have no uh, we have no guests, so we're living. We're living proofs that you can build a, a life of freedom into your business because we're living it right this second. Uh, we had a uh, a amazing, wonderful training this morning with Deborah Dupree. We'll talk a little bit about some of our takeaways and things that we uh, that we highlighted from that particular training session. We're taking questions from the Lead Gen Scripts and Objections Facebook group. We'll take uh, a few questions uh, from you live uh, if you have some good ones here. So if you're joining us live on Facebook, thank you so much, uh, and we will bring uh, bring your questions to. Uh, Greg, Greg McDaniel, what is Yo, up? Today? What up, dude? I'm changing my name from your name because I'm not Matt Johnson. I'm Greg McDaniel. Yeah. I don't want there to be any confusion out there in the great wild world of uh, Facebook going, who is du Matt Johnson twice? Is he that egotistical? He needs his name there twice. Greg gets no <laughs> face time. <laughs> just that i'm just that narcissistic i went into your name and changed it to mine <laughs> but the funny thing is is that the the, the blue jeans account is in your name so it automatically assumes that it's you <laughs> what we'll i have to go back and change but yeah dude deborah dupree's um you know how to be an introvert and just kill it in in real estate dude she crushed it i know i don't know about you dude i seriously was i mean i have a good solid page and change of notes that i mm -hmm. you know it, it just it was unbelievable to understand how much of the stuff that you and I have been teaching without knowing that there's any clinical backing to this. You know, a lot of these things were, were you know, are, are, are now reinforced, you know, to the fact that the way the male and the female brain works, you know, the, how significant the number three is, you know, questions with the, 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 you know, who, what, why, and how, I mean, the list goes on and on. It's just a fascinating program. Yeah, yeah, it was it was insane. That that training was ridiculously good. So, for those of you uh, who registered, uh, even if you weren't able to hop on the live training with us earlier today, it was it was free to everyone that registered um, over the last few days and, and the, the last week. <clears throat> but the uh, the recording went out to everybody. Um, but I apologize, my apologies to anyone that did not get a chance to register, or if you ignored the email uh, that went out and did not follow through and register, we are very sorry. Uh, the recording went out to those who did register and did make an attempt to uh, to show up today. But uh, there will be we'll, we'll talk about how that's going to be made available later on. We might bring uh, Deborah back for some uh, either four week training courses or something like that. We're definitely turning that training that we recorded today <laughs> into. Oh my a, God. I just <laughs> look back. <laughs> <laughs> As for those of you listening, that was Chris Callahan, Greg's business partner, creeping up on him from behind, uh, oh jaw God. style. I just got my heart pumping a good. I don't need any more coffee. I'm putting that cup down. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Oh my gosh, so we got a bunch of people watching with us. We've got Lisa, Marie, Morgan, uh, Josh, Walter, what is up, man? Holly, thank you guys so much for watching us uh, live here on Facebook. Make sure to bring your questions. Make sure to subscribe uh, to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube, depending on whether you want the video and audio versions. Uh, and we just thank you guys. Um, we cannot thank you enough, actually, for spreading the show. You guys notice we don't do like a bunch of uh, paid advertising. Uh, we don't run a bunch of ads or anything like that. I mean, the growth of the show has been through people stumbling onto us uh, by accident and from you guys sharing it with your friends and family in the business. So we appreciate that. Dude, but let's, uh, uh, Matt, Holly Smith, big shout out to you, girlfriend. Just mm -hmm. shared it. You guys share it out. Spread the yep. word like wildfire, wild, wildfire, man. Let it, right. get you it, can it, actually it, do yeah. more than just telling people. You can actually physically share it onto your Facebook feed and uh, spread the love. So let's uh, let's take a question real quick here. Jessica Lee on the Lead Gen Scripts uh, group says, does anyone have a script for cold calling homeowners who bought in a downturn? to see if they might want to sell now in a seller's market. Who bought in the downturn, so they have tons of equity and they're ready tons to cash equity. out. Yep. Um, yeah. They were the it, smart ones. Yeah, the, the intelligent ones. So, okay. <laughs> hey, Matt, Julie, and your three obese little wood denting baby little bastards, little insulin, mm -hmm. insulin suckers. Um, That's right. <laughs> insulin sieves. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I would say something like this. Matt and Julie, hey, you guys, I just, I see that you guys bought in 2009. Good time to buy. I mean, as you guys know, the prices went through the floor. You guys saw that. It's incredibly, you know, intuitive of you guys. Have you guys put any thought into potentially cashing out, taking the equity, maybe, maybe, or just doing a refi and taking some of the cash out and going out and buying a, maybe an investment property or maybe just selling the home itself, and maybe upgrading? Have you guys thought about doing something like that? It's it, I, that's you know compliment them right off the bat you know and then talk about multiple different options that they may be able to utilize um, okay. and and use that money because it's literally just sitting there why not pull it out and start doing something with it 
I, yeah, sense. yeah. Not... To me, this seems like a pretty, pretty no brain as far as the script. I mean, it, it's such, it's such an interesting situation. I mean, when somebody has a ton of equity, and we're coming to what might be the peak of the market. I mean, this is, it literally is in their best interest. Uh, as long as they have the next step correctly planned out, this is a great time to cash out. If they bought during the downturn, man, cash out, get your money, go rent something for a couple of years, wait for the next downturn, and then buy something bigger. Yep. Actually, keep, I, I keep moving up or investment property. I actually talked to someone just the other day that he has a bunch of uh, friends of his. His, his girlfriend works with incredibly wealthy people, like 100 millionaires and billionaires and stuff like that. And a lot of those folks, there's one guy who has 25 investment properties. He's, he's liquidating all of them and going cash heavy because he's like, yep. dude, I see the tip of the iceberg and I'm out. I don't know when that thing's yep. going to slip and we're, and we're done. So it's interesting to see what the smart money is doing again, you guys. I mean, just really be att paying attention to what's going on, you know, out in the marketplaces. They're starting the, you know, the button to flip, you use other people's money to flip properties again. They're starting those seminars again. They started them right before the market crashed in 2008, guys. They did them starting in 2000, 2007. And people, the stupid money jumped in like, yeah, we're going to do all this. And then they got caught with their pants down. When that market dropped like that, boom, they couldn't, they were underwater literally overnight. So yeah. it's a good opportunity to talk to your clients. Good time to make that phone call. Good time to, you know, sell, not sell, inform with a little bit of fear and reality, you know, bring them back to, you know, the last go around. Now it's not going to drop like it did last time. There's just sa your safety precautions put into place, but there will be a downturn. There will be a downturn. <laughs> uh, I, I would just like to point out that, um, well, who was it? The French, the French in World War II had their precautions too. It was called the Magano line. Uh, the Germans ran around it. So the point being, you can't, you can't <laughs> fight the last war. Basically, we have a bunch of protocols uh, that are in place to prevent the last downturn, the next mm -hmm. downturn. Anytime you blow up a bubble, it, the bubble is going to pop somewhere. It's never going to pop in the exact same place it popped last time. Uh, so just because there's a bunch of precautions in it and we have things like Dodd-Frank and stuff like that, it's, it's still a mess. And it's potentially the downturn, whatever it is, and whenever it is, it's potentially going to be bigger or even much bigger than the uh the last one because our economics are not the fundamentals are not good let's put it that way so no we have a false we have, we have a false reality in our yeah, stability of our, of our marketplaces yeah. you know so in that in that in that wonderful idea guys follow me if you want something unstable follow me <laughs> on facebook <laughs> you'll be able to watch all kinds of weird shit you'll also That's be right. able to follow matt he's more stable you know he's more like dodd frank i'm more like the market in 2008 shaky fun <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Let's. Uh, this is another. This is a good one here. Steve Manning says when a potential client says that number is not enough incentive for us to move, when the number you're talking about is higher than any comp in the area and would actually set a new precedent. Now this is something interesting because I was um, so in in my other life I produce and host other podcasts. Right. One of them being the luxury listing specialist, and one of the guests that we're looking at bringing on. And you see this a lot in in luxury real estate agents. They they're able to, one of the, their credibility indicators or the, the success stories that they tell is that they were able, able to set a new record for a home within a certain neighborhood, right? Mm. Now, how do you actually, in real life, when somebody wants to do that, when you encounter a homeowner who basically wants to turn you into that agent and they want to ba basically make you get bragging rights for setting a new precedent for the highest sale, <laughs> sale price ever recorded in that neighborhood, that? how do you come back and kind of ground them in reality and say, let's, you know, the only way this house is going to sell is it's 100 grand below where your expectations are at. Let's come back to uh, the earth a little bit. First off, you know, you got to go into it with the understanding and, and being okay with the fact that if you do a little bit of work, there's a pretty good chance that you're not going to sell the house because it's just not going to sell. If it's not, there's no, there's no comps. There's no, well, let's hope there's no idiots out there that are willing to pay substantially above list price if they're the on, only player in town. I had a conversation with this guy you, last week. Same thing. He said the value of my of my property, he's got two or three acres on the top of his little knoll, 360 views, 180 views of Mount Diablo. What, by the way, these these are really good things for my valley. Um, he said my value is about 1.6, but that doesn't interest me. Almost the exact same verbiage, but 2 million does. And I'm like, hmm, so you're a slimy douchebag. Okay. Um, and so what I did is I just said, hey, look, you know what? Let's a, it's a great opportunity. Let's take a look at it. Let's see if there's some, uh, you know, something out there that maybe could, you know, help justify that. You know, mm -hmm. I work with builders. They might want to look at it. I'm just basically just stroking his ego, going, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. You're so full of shit. It's stupid. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. But okay. I'm not. I'm not telling him he's an idiot. 
I'm just remaining a, a, a confidant. So if the market does change and does come up to his value, now he's always going to be unrealistic. He's going to be another 200 grand, 400 grand above the, the actual marketplace. Mm -hmm. But he might have friends that might be more realistic than him than he is. He might have colleagues more realistic. So again, it's about building the relationship with the person. And, and I mean, don't I mean I always joke around, but don't actually call them stupid because they have friends and family <laughs> uh, that we might want to work off of and everything else. So, I mean, that's that's how I would handle it, but always ask, so maybe, and this is the script, Matt, I think what you're looking for. Okay. Is, so Matt and Julie, you know, I, I sometimes miss things, not often, but I do. Um, is there a comp or is there an evaluation that you've seen here in the area that would, you know, that would justify that 2 million mm -hmm. or whatever the number is gonna be? And they're gonna say no. Then you say, okay, okay, good. I just wanted to check. You know, sometimes I, I, I mess up. I'm human. I, I get one mess up a year, and that would have been mine. Um, and then just kind of play and joke around. That's that's the way I would have done it, man. No yeah, real magic to it. So what, what would you do, Matt, since you're more A to B, B, C, C to D? In that situation, yeah, well, I think that is the best question is, you know, what what information am I missing or what other home out there? I, I Probably what I would do is just point out that, you know, look, the, the buyers, if they have an agent or even if they're just looking on Zillow, they're looking at the same information we are. Mm -hmm. So what is the – I mean, put yourself in their shoes. What is their incentive to make you an offer or to come up to the price that you want? What's in it for them, right? So you always want to put yeah. yourself in the, the other person's position. So let's take a step out of our position and what we would like to get because obviously I would love to get you more money because that makes me more money too. So I would love to sell your home for a higher price, but let's put ourselves in their shoes what justifies them making that offer or coming up to that listing price? And if you can't come up with a good answer or if you just say, well, we're just looking for the right buyer, right? That, that's mm -hmm. To me, that's probably the, the hardest objection sometimes that you overcome with that or, or the, the hardest one that you get is they know that 90% of people are not, but they think there's that imaginary needle in a haystack of someone who is going to offer them more than everyone else just because magic. Magic. It's just magic. I don't know of any other reason why they would do that. Um, so, they, they're, they're all the angels in the haystack that you want, um, <laughs> but that still doesn't mean they're all good. They're going to offer like 20% over what anybody else has offered, especially if it's like if they're trying to like set a precedent for the neighborhood. What is the incentive for the buyer? Put yourself in their shoes, uh, because especially if they're, especially if it's another agent bringing them mm -hmm. by, the very first thing they're going to do is look at the exact same comparables that we're looking at right now. And if they determine that we're 20, 10 or 20% off, what are they going to do? They're going to come up with what you consider a low ball offer. You're going to be insulted. It, you're going to reject the offer. It's going to start this whole horrible cycle that we're going to go through, and it's going to be a terrible experience for you. And you're, then you're going to spend six months sitting on the market, opening your home up all these times to people that end up offering you way below what you want. It's just going to be a miserable experience for both of us. God, you depressed me hearing that. That sounded horrible. I would never want to do that. But the, the no, person would, who would want to subject themselves to that. Nobody. I mean, the, the buyer would have to, you know, been a graduate of the University of Stupid. You know, instead of University of Things, University of Stupid. But I mean, <laughs> Wayne has a good point. You know, the, the triple F script. You know, you know, Matt. I know how you feel. You know, I felt the same way when yeah. when I was in my house and I wanted to get top dollar for it. But what I found is I just sat on the market, and my wife nearly divorced me. My kids, you know, hated me. My daughter went out and became pregnant and got purple hair and piercings. It was horrible. It took months for to put the whole thing back together, and it's all because of my greed. You know, it's it's the feel felt found. I love the triple F, dude. Wayne, the way to bring that up, dude. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a good one. All right, so guys, before we take the uh, the next question, guys, go over to um, RockstarProspecting.com. We've got the the latest dates up for the next round of classes. Uh, yeah. We are in between like our second and third session for the class that we're going through right now. So we have gone into like the hardcore scripting, the just sold, just listed, just pending. Um, the buyer need and the investor scripts and all that stuff. And now next week we're going to get into like the go for no script and just the whole go for no mentality that you're using on your live prospecting, how to actually apply it. And we're doing a lot of live role training with our, with our students that are going through the class. So if that's something that you would find valuable, go over to rockstarprospecting.com. So guys, we're horrible sometimes at letting people know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> like for example, with the, uh, with the live training this morning, we did some light promotion. We did a couple of emails, a few posts and stuff like that, but we had, you know, 200 and some people register and uh, we're blown away by the response because we're sometimes bad at telling people how to connect with us and how to um, get into classes and trainings and stuff like that with us. So we're trying to do a better job. Bear with us. Yeah. And well, um, well Matt, we, we have a new class we're building right now and I got to tell you, it's pretty sexy. 
<laughs> it is sexy. It's like it has curves. Yeah. It yeah. does. It's, got, it's like it's like that good-looking chick with those nice tight jeans on, just sexy. You know, you just got to go over top. Right. All right, all right. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's not turn the 70% male audience into a 99% male audience. Oh, I just like I just like you know I, Midori's like whispering behind me going ah oh, Christ what the fuck Jesus what, mm-hmm. what's wrong with this yes. man? If she wasn't an independent contractor, this would <laughs> definitely be creating a hostile work environment. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> All right, guys. There's a, there's there's another good question. We we are working on another uh, uh, yeah. class. So the the class that we're working on right now and building all the content for is called Get Now Business. Uh, in other words, it's all the things that you could do if you were to like we have so many people watching the show that uh, that are either getting into real estate, just got into real estate, or like want to kind of restart their career. Or either they just they need to hit the refresh button, or they're literally parachuting into a new area. They moved with a spouse, or they relocated, or whatever, and they don't know anybody in the area, and they got to get now business. That's what this next class is coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be building all the content, and finishing everything up, so that we can announce it and probably start that class uh, in May. So that's uh, that's what's coming up. It's already almost April, Greg. Good lord. Oh man, who gave, who gave it permission to go and go into Q2 of 2017? Oh. That was oh. Christmas the other day. I know. I got to set my quarter two objectives. All right, Kyle Metcalf. Uh, question on the the uh, lead gen scripts and objections. And, and by the way, guys, let's. Um, boy, those are two good questions. Let's get to those in a second from Wayne. Uh, first, Kyle Metcalf's question. Um, scenario is that you're talking to a seller. It's an expired seller, and you say, Hey, if you had sold your home. Where were you planning to move? An expired listing says, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> How do you handle that one, Greg? Say, okay, well, you know what? It's a, it's a common occurrence that people don't always know where they're going to be landing. No, are you guys thinking about staying in town, or are you guys maybe thinking about moving out of town, first off? Mm-hmm. You know, ro- roll with me right now. Just, just roll with All me. Right. In town or out of town? This would be in town. In town? Okay. Now, I know that, you know, all of us do this, but we always kind of have our eyes kind of out there looking around of areas. I mean, given what the local economy and the prices and everything, if you will say we were able to get that number that you were looking for and you were going to net out the number that you, that you really wanted, what's your number one choice, your first place? And actually, you know what? Give me your top three places that you, you know, areas that you'd want to move. Oh man, it's it's tough. There, we've had a lot of uh, discussions with my wife and I. You know, she wants to be closer to the beach. Um, you know, like I work from home, so I need that extra bedroom in the office. You know, the closer you get to the beach, the the smaller the the, the homes and the square footage and stuff like that. So it's tough to narrow it down because it really just comes down to you know, does she win or do I win? Uh, we, mm-hmm. I hate it. I hate to put it that way, but yeah, that, that's so. There's, there's been a lot of discussion. That's why we're not quite sure where we'd land. I mean, ultimately, it probably comes down to school districts and things like that. Well, Matt, I got I got to tell you, I'm gonna burst your bubble. She's gonna win, bud. So, you know, <laughs> well, it, yes, but it, you, I, then it's either it's either that, or if we get a smaller house that's closer to the beach, then I have to go get office space somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Well, so, I, so I, somehow there has to be space to to work and get stuff done. Right. Absolutely. Let's do this. Now, I know you guys are really thinking about X, Y, and Z area close to the close to the beach. Why don't I do this? I am I have access to a secret MLS, um, and I can tap into that for you. These are people that they're dying to sell. They just don't want to go in the market. Um, and I'll, I'll start searching that for you. Is that is that something that would be helpful for you? Yeah, of course, man. Okay. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll start digging into that for you. Um, we do a lot of cold calls. We'll start calling into the neighborhood, seeing if we can find anybody doing cold calls, and we'll blast the place like an atomic bomb with uh, with Facebook talking about a buyer that's desperately trying to get into the area. See what we can, you know the bushes we can hit. See what will help. Is that if we start doing that for you? Um, do you think your wife would be more willing to to move as soon as if we found her something versus waiting for something to come on the market? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think if you're able to, you know, put something in front of her that she could say yes or no to, and it, it hit, you know, her criteria, um, and it still could, you know, could work for me for for business. Um, yeah, I think she'd jump at it. Okay, then let's do that. Um, I will get working on that right now for you, and I'll haul her back at you probably about a week, week and a half after we have some results, and I'll let you know what's going on, or if I'll let you know sooner if I do find something sooner. But if you guys find something out there, you're driving around or symptom or someone tells you about it, you know, just give me a ring. I'll dig into it for you and figure out the details. Cool? Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Rock and roll. Peace. Peace out, Ninja. All right. Peace out, Ninja. So, all right. So, go, take me through the strategy of that real quick. So, this, this is an expired listing, and you're essentially looking to you're, – you're, you're kind of going with the 
draw them out, not force them out, right? Because their motivation isn't super, super strong. They're not even sure exactly where they're going to end up. So it's clearly not like a, it can be like a super pain point. Otherwise, they would know exactly where they're going. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of like drawing them out. And so the carrot on the end of the stick is, it's that next house, that house mm-hmm. that hopefully that you can find that hits enough of their criteria um, that it's like one of those things where they'll say, yeah, let's, you know, let's move forward. Let's, let's get the home back on the market. Let's get this thing sold so we can go after a house like that. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm reestablishing trust because if it's an expired property, you don't like agents all that much because you, you got your hope, hopes up. They were dashed against the rocks of reality. Now you're going, well, fuck, I'm not going to trust another agent. You know, all you, gotta, all you gotta do is just put on the MLS and just sit there on your fat ass and just do nothing. So I'm like, okay, why don't I get out and hustle for you? Why don't I get out there? I'll do cold calls. I'll do blow up social media. I'll access my se- secret MLS, which I, there is really a secret MLS, guys. I did, that's not bullshit. Um, access my secret MLS. So I'm proactive, 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 working on the assumption that when, when I find that for you, then we'll work together because now your wife, is who, I mean, you have three obese babies, Matt. I mean, they are big animals to take care of. We need to make sure that when we herd them to the next house that we do it oh, so easy, <laughs> easy trip. <laughs> Nose pinch. Yeah, no, I, really, now my kids my kids no longer need to be transported. They need to be herded. They need, <laughs> to, be, they need to be herded. Like, I got to hire herdsmen. I got to hire no. shepherds to move my kids from one house to another. Oh, Man, yeah, alive. A- all you need is a border collie, man. All you need is a border collie. <laughs> <laughs> Just nipping at their fat heels. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right. Oh, too much fun. Oh, These poor kids God. get degraded. I know, <laughs> man. These imaginary kids, man, they have no self-esteem left. Man, life. Greg, Greg is like the world's worst gym teacher. He keeps <laughs> making you climb that rope. Just climb that rope, fat ass. Climb it. Climb it. Come. Not going fast enough. <laughs> Standing on your tippy toes doesn't mean it's cl- you're climbing, okay? That's just reaching. That's right. Um, but <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm giving your wife and you a, a renewed sense in the overall industry. And so okay. w- so it takes a little bit of my time, a little bit of my money, and it's an opportunity where, dude, if you fail, then you fail. It's up to you. But if you epically succeed, like my buddy Matt and his, and his I don't know if it's a, sure it's a wife or girlfriend, but they're a three-month-old little baby. Dude, I was able to find them a house. And unfortunately, the guy that was living there now has changed his mind, doesn't want to sell right now. He's going to wait a couple of months. <clears throat> but, you know, it's still, it's still an opportunity for a listing down the road. But I went out and hustled for him before we even got anything. And, yeah. dude, Matt, Matt's like, dude, that's awesome, man. My wife would be pumped to live in this neighborhood or girlfriend or whatever. My baby mama would be happy. I'm like, cool. Hmm. All right. Let's rock and roll. And so, I mean, this is the second time that we have worked with his family um, and he liked how, what we did last time. And ironically, the house that he want, he may buy is in the exact same neighborhood that uh, that we sold his family's house in. Exact same neighborhood. So he's like literally moving home. Oh wow, nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It all comes back around. All right. So uh, so Wayne had a couple of good questions, and then Lindsay Soprani, uh, who's been on the show before, also sent me a, a, a question um, earlier today that I want to make sure we get to all these. So, uh, good lord. Um, Man, then we got another good question from Thomas March. All right, so we're we're got some really good questions. Let's start with Wayne's question on if you could only work six hours a week, what would you do? And Greg, this is a hypothetical because no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Greg, you actually do work way more than six hours a week. I was gonna make a joke about that being reality for you, but sadly it's not. Um, you no. basically you have a real estate job in between all the podcasting and calls to me, um, yeah. where you do actual real work. Yes, I, yes, I do, and I do, and I do like what I do. And as a every every if there's a hole in my schedule, I will fill it with calls, follow. I, I mean, I was following up with leads from 2015 again uh, today uh, from an email, and I got one of these guys, Mike, Mark, Mark, 2015, old curmudgeon of a, of a gentleman, but he was actually nice to me. And he's like, yeah, call me back in you know end of, you know middle of May, and we're thinking about buying some more investment properties. I'm like, okay. You know, so yeah, I mean, guys, I really do actually spend a lot of my time doing both sides of this thing. Um, so, right. but yeah, six hours. So you've got essentially five days a week. You've got an hour and twenty, you've got an hour and fifteen minutes to work. What would you do? Hire people and leverage my time is what yeah, I would do. 100%. I would hire Gene Velpe to do so to do sales. I mean, social media. He's about three or four hundred bucks. He's gonna. He's been on the show twice. I would hire talent prospecting my ISA team. They are they are doing a really good job for me to do cold calls and uh, FISBOs and expireds and everything else. And then I would reserve my time for either networking 
and or going on appointments. That's how I would leverage my time. If only it's six hours a week. God, that is a dreamboat of an opportunity. Yeah. But Matt, yeah. what about you? Um, if you want to work six hours a week and actually make more uh, than what it takes just to feed yourself at McDonald's, the only way to do that is to spend most of those six hours oh. leading a team of people where the team does the actual work and your six hours is spent holding them accountable. And there's two things you have to hold them accountable. The easiest part is the operations part, which is just the managing of clients. That's actually easier. The hardest thing to manage is getting people to do your lead gen and your marketing. Yes, and I forgot someone. I would hire, I have hired Viral to do my database, you know, mm -hmm. mining. So I would do Gene Delby for outbound social, Talon for outbound calling, Viral for inbound and database management and control. And yes, Wayne, I saw your comment, and I am doing that. I was going to say, Wayne, uh, uh, me too, I, as as evidenced by the fact that I've spent most of today outside of the podcast on meetings with my people. <laughs> my peoples. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, 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 that I am doing it. I am, and I'm also, I'm, I'm leveraging, I'm uh, going to be leveraging um, uh, FirePoint with Chris Tam. He's integrating with all these crazy people. So Mojo, who I use and my ISA team, ta uh, Talon uh, uses, will integrate directly into my top producer CRM. You know, okay. it's, it's, they're all, so wait, it's all Fire, you've got FirePoint and top producer integrate interfacing with each other to share contacts and stuff like no, that. No, we're waiting. Firepoint, uh, it's they're working on their internal internal search, and as soon as that gets sorted out, what Chris is going to get done in the next week or two, then we're gonna we're gonna get port everything over. We're gonna have Beverly go in and tear our database apart, clean it up so mm -hmm. it's actually a clean database, in up upload it into Fire. I know, I know, shocking. I actually do something in regards to no, systems. For three years, Greg. Three years, Greg. Come on now. And you're just finally getting through my thick skull. So, yeah. <laughs> just, just lean away. So, all right. So that's the next. Yeah. So essentially, you're moving in, the, in that direction, guys, because Wayne doesn't know this, but we've talked about this for a long time. I mean, when, when Greg and I first started chatting about like doing a show and stuff like that and just his own real estate business, we always toyed with the idea of doing something like the four hour work week for real estate. Mm -hmm. And it's more like it ends up being more like the four hour work day. Even yeah. that's tough to do in real estate because you have to have some time for lead generation. And it's just the nature of real estate being the fact that nobody needs your services until every five or seven years. Like unless you've got a really good team like Talon that kind of does all the spinning for you and getting rid of all the unqualified people that you shouldn't be talking to and narrow it down to just those few people. It's really hard to kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to narrow down your lead gen time. Right. And in order to have a really good real estate business, you typically have to spend three hours a day in lead gen, another hour or two hours of whatever in follow up. Uh, and so there's your five hours a day right there that you haven't even gone on a single appointment and you haven't managed a single client. Right. So in order to incorporate all of that, even into just like a four hour work day, you have to have your lead gen system like down and you've got to have somebody helping you out with the client management. You've got to have either a transaction coordinator or a full blown executive assistant slash operations manager like you have, Greg. Yeah, and then I also, we I have Playster is my website and I'm a part of an exclusive 30 and 30 pro pilot program they're, they're running for 30 days, get 30 leads. But I hire Gene to do all the nitty gritty cool stuff to you know lead gen, get, get the people coming back to their, to their site. But I would mm -hmm. use Playster for lead capture from what mm -hmm. Gene is building. So there's there's so right. many different moving pieces out there that you can leverage your time. I mean, the the program we're putting together, getting now business, we're trying we're going to try to get now business without doing cold calls or door knocking, cold door knocking, um, and keep it under I think under a $500 budget a month for everything. Mm -hmm. So we're, that's what we're working on right now. So we're that's why our minds are very in tuned into this because I think it's very Matt. I mean, the more research we do, guys. The, the the cooler products I find and Matt I sent you did I send you the email or just send it to myself? I'm sure last you time? did, and I'm sure it went straight into the um, the round file. Oh great, right. <laughs> not caring. I get it. Uh, um, Dave, you're you, I mentioned Mojo. Yeah, Mojo works really well for me because I'm doing circle prospecting. Dobby, and then by the way, Dobby. Huh? Dobby, not Dave. Dobby. Oh, Dobby. Sorry, man. Totally fucked up your name. Um, but that's me. That's why I don't do when I do circle prospecting. I don't call people by the first names. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So thank you, valued listener number 373. Uh, let's get to your question now. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. Totally parlayed perfectly into that. Um, but yeah, no, for, for circle prospecting, and if, if it's like, hi, Matt. Oh, Matt doesn't live there. Oh, oh, okay. 
Oh, oh, hey, oh, you hung up on me, damn it. Okay. But I just say, hey, my name is Greg McDaniel. I do my script. I jump right into it. I don't give a shit if, if someone fucking moved two years ago, ten years ago, or still lives there. If there's a human body on the other end, other end of that phone, and it's and it's really that address, party on, Wayne. Party on, Garth. Mm-hmm. I'll we'll, we'll, we'll keep uh, keep the conversation going to see what I can do to help them, or they can do to help me. All right. Quickly though, on on the issue of like Mojo versus Vulcan. So, my understanding is, and this comes a little bit from Aaron too, is um. Uh, Vulcan maybe a little bit better as far as overall data quality, but that even within that, that still varies from place to place, and there's no way to know unless you test it side by side. And so, yeah, I mean, Davi, you might it just might be your area, uh, but they're great products, Greg. You've used Mojo for a long, long time, and you get their data directly from them. Um, but I have heard that. I mean, just not not like Vulcan Seven over Mojo. Just the the idea of having to kind of mix and match and play with the different data sets in your area until you find what works. Yeah, I mean, Vulcan's for expireds, you know, and and Fizbos. You know, I use Mojo for circle prospecting. You know, people then say, well, why don't you go out and get coal data? Uh, well, I say, well, coal data is twelve hundred dollars a year. Mine's three hundred dollars a year, and my the 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 variance of difference of, of of quality is so marginal for me. It doesn't make any sense to spend the extra money. And by the way, mm-hmm. we go back to the cell phone thing. Don't ever fucking call a cell phone through a, through an electronic dialer ever. If you get caught, you there's a sixteen thousand dollar fine attached to every number dial that's a cell phone. It can crank up to be a substantial like hundreds of millions of dollars if you do it actively um but you can't call cell phones with this thing your little fat nugget if you want to dial it in <laughs> you can do that <laughs> or use something like firepoint i believe chris was saying the firepoint has just the single click dialing so it gets around those it doesn't have mm-hmm. that exposure to um uh the liability right I, I, dude, he said it's not, been a while since we interviewed chris but i'm pretty said, sure that's the case to me, he said nothing automated no right. text, no calls, no drop messages, nothing automated to cell phones because there is that loophole. I mean, if you want to do, go, go chat with, uh, go, go hit up Firepoint and ask them yourselves, guys. Chris is super yep. cool. Or it has more of a support staff. Yeah. All right. So that was Thomas March's question of uh, fear of uh, the dialer with cell phones. Let's get to Lindsay's uh, question, which was, um, uh, ha- have we got anybody's, let me, let me get to the actual specific question here. So I get the, the phrasing right. So she asks, um, uh let's see come on scroll up there we go and now scroll back down okay. <laughs> do it. Come on. hey i was uh, uh may, may have missed it but do you have uh any issues like any um help for buyers agents uh to deal with the shifting market and how to compete with multiple offers so Lindsay's up on the east coast uh building a team out there greg you you've dealt with this for a long time just because of the level of demand in the bay area so how do you compete i mean you you do a mixture of both so you you're in kind of both waters you list and you work with you know million dollar buyers Mm -hmm. so when you go in knowing it's going to be like a multiple offer scenario what are some of the things that you do okay so actually this is a really good question for me because i love going i love doing multiple offers as long as you need to understand the the wherewithal that the buyer is going to have and see if they have the ability to really compete because if they're just going to go like right at list price and there's multiple offers just don't don't write the offer I mean, you're going to lose. If there's like four or five offers and you go at ask price with contingencies at the, you know, standard, you're done. You're, before even, you wasted your time and ink and, you know, and whatever else to do that offer. But if they can play ball, this is my strategy. Matt and Julie, okay, so here's, here's what we're going to do. I talked to the listing agent, and I, I figured out that we are going to be number five at this point, but they're going to take offers tomorrow afternoon. So I'm going to wait until tomorrow mid-morning to reach out to them to figure out if anyone else is going to come into the party and has been said that they're going to be writing. I asked him a couple of questions as well. I asked him, is he writing an offer? He said no. I asked him if anyone in his office was going to be writing an offer. He said no. And I asked him if there's going to be anything that those sellers would be would like to see in the offer that might, you know, help them sway our direction, you know, kind of sweeten the pot a little bit. Mm-hmm. So he said that they would like to get a 30 to 60 day rent back at no cost. Um, and they're looking to uh, go at, you know, you know, yeah, as is. So we have two different options here. We can try to buy the house or we can just go buy the damn thing and we can throw everything at it. Because I know that we've had a couple of offers that we've lost. And I know that that's really been kind of eating you guys up. And I'm sure you don't want to spend any more Saturdays in the car with me. <laughs> but let's uh, let's let's wait until tomorrow afternoon or mid-morning to figure out what we're going up against. Because if the other five offers don't show up 
and we might be the only party in town. We'll write this thing for full list, and we'll get this thing done. Maybe give them a 30-day rent back and be done with this whole process. But if we're going up against one or four, I need to know what we're doing because that's going to affect our price point as well because we're at a million fifty on this property. But I know that we've talked in the past, and you can go – you don't want to, but you can go to about a million – you know, one million one twenty-five, really pushing the, the the higher elevations there. We may need to do that, depending on what the offer amount of offers are. And I want you guys to go home and I want you to discuss it wholeheartedly on how much you want the property. Therefore, we can come back together as a team and we can attack this process and go get you guys a house. Is that okay? Does that sound like a fair plan for you? Yeah, that's really good. Guys, you should literally just play that back. <laughs> there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of bits of phrasing in there. I mean, just like, hey, let's come together. We'll discuss it as a team. Just stuff that's so ingrained. You probably are not thinking about as much anymore. Um, it may have not been natural at one point, but now it is. But there's a lot of stuff in there that people could really benefit from just hearing that over and over and over again and getting that language kind of into their natural vocabulary. Yeah, and it's, the other thing is, guys, is that you you need to be an advocate for your clients. So when you call the other agent up, even if you fucking hate that person, right? Be like, hey, Matt, what's going on, man? Hey, it's Greg over Jay Rockliffe with the McDaniel Callahan team. Hey, I got some wonderful clients. We've missed out on a couple of properties. You know, they got two little kiddos. We're trying to get them into a school. No, sorry, they got three big kiddos. Uh, we're trying to get them into, into the schools here sooner than later in a dialysis program. But I was wondering... You know, where are your folks going? What's their timeline? What are they looking at? What are they looking at for offers? And then, Matt, you're going to tell me something that your clients are looking to sell. Like, give me a, give me a scenario. Uh, looking to sell in the next, what, what are you looking for, like 20 days, so, two weeks? No, so term. So it's a million fifty of five off, you potentially five offers, you know. So you're going to say, well, Greg, there's a, we sent out, you know, 12 disclosure packages. I've heard back from five different agents that they are going to be writing. You know, I have three in hand right now. We're looking at the offers tomorrow afternoon. By the way, those freaking agents that are handing in the, the offers that soon are morons, absolute morons, because they wrote with no knowledge of the competition whatsoever. I always try to be the last offer in. Therefore, I know all the different offers, how many are out there, what put, and then I ask the agent if they'll tell me, and this is where it comes back to having a really good reputation in the area that you work in and a good trusted working relationship, because if Matt, you and I were, were buddies, right? We we see each other at brokers tours, we joke around, you know, maybe we grab beers or new every once in a while. I'm like, look, Matt, dude, can you just level with me? I don't want the exact number, but give me a range. Where do I need to land to get this thing done? My people mm -hmm. really need to get into a house. Mm -hmm. Then you say, Greg, look, between you, me, and a fence post, you're going to be north of 1-1, one, one, but less than, a, less than a million, probably 50. Great. Okay. Now I know that I can push my people, push. I would advise my people potentially to the million 125, which would be their max, which they're going all in. And they say, look, and they're also looking for, you know, 10 day, 10 day physical inspections, 12 days appraisal, 12, you know, 12 days, you know, loan. I'm like, mm -hmm. ooh, God, the loan's a little tight. Do you think we could bump the loan to 14, do the appraisal at 12 if we order it before we even go into escrow, and I can get my, my inspectors out there ASAP and we can get the reports back? Yeah, Greg, uh, that should be pretty good. I, I will, and I'll push for you, man. We've done deals in the past. You know, I know you and your team are solid. So you know, I, I'll, I'll do what I can to help you guys get this thing. Gotcha. That's the magic of working with buyers in a competitive market. You need to treat the agents like gold, man. The, even if you don't like them, dude, this is a game of smoke and mirrors. It mm -hmm. really is. Every agent's going to smile at you, but they'll stab you in the back. But if you can be <laughs> genuinely interested, they do, dude, seriously. Um, but, I mean, if you can be genuine and be really – like, because it is. It's about your client. You, you are employed by your client. And you need to go represent their interest with the best knowledge possible. You can't, you cannot come to me as a, if I was a listing agent, you're the buyer's agent, and say, oh, we like your house. We're taking offers. Well, in two days. Great. Here's my offer. Mm -hmm. What the hell? I'm going to go, I'm going to go call everybody that's writing an offer going, hey, I guys got another offer. You guys want to put one in? Hey, got, got another offer. You guys want to put one in? Because my job as a listing agent is to get the highest and best price for my, for my client. Yours to get the lowest and best price for yours. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I don't know yeah. why people do that. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully it helped. I, yeah, I think it did. That's what's interesting is that how much of it comes down to very, um, and, and it goes back to your heritage of learning from your dad, who's, who's very, very old school. He, he has a lot of um, 
tech ideas and is very fascinated by that, but your dad is very good at just the classic, the, the interpersonal stuff, the interpersonal side of real estate, the interagent side of real estate. Mm-hmm. And that's where you get a lot of that stuff. So you have that perspective of yes, all the Facebook and all the, all the shiny object stuff is awesome. And there's, we have a lot of that for reaching clients, but at the end of the day, sometimes it still comes down to your interpersonal stuff with other agents, which is very frustrating for a high D uh, like me. I just want to, I just want to get on with it and uh, and not deal with that stuff. But yeah, it's it's true. It, it is a lot. Of the, sometimes that is the difference between the deal and, and not doing the deal. Yeah, it is, but guys. If you if you want the verbiage, go back and rewatch that again a couple of times. I put a ton of nuggets in there. If you guys just go take it, literally copy it and use it, I bet you anything you'll start building better relationship with your fellow agents in your areas, um, and hopefully be able to get the best term, lowest terms, and best. The best price for your buyers. Yeah, very cool. All right, so one one last question, and then if, uh, or at least from the Legion and Scripts guy and Objections Group guys, if you have uh, if you have some quick questions you want us to cover before the end of the show, put them right below here in uh, in Facebook as a comment. But uh, Pavel Stepanov has a good question here from the from the Facebook group. It says, what do agents do when they don't produce? They usually decide to change brokerages. Do you agree that the grass is greener on the other side, or is, or the problem is within the agent? The agent's always going to be, br- blame the brokerage because, you know, people are always in a blaming society. It's you, 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 you. You always point the finger. It's a problem when you point the finger at someone, there's three more pointing right back at you, all right? Mm-hmm. And so you've got to take responsibility. Unless you were like a horrible factory accident. Yes. Just just like this. Ha, I blamed you. <laughs> you. <laughs> you went a different direction with that. All right. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of just missing fingers, but okay. You could also point all – you could you could also point with some to someone or point at someone with all five of your fingers. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's actually true. Yes, we we do live in a very uh, very blaming society. Very very few people take ownership of their own success. Right, and people, you know, when they blame somebody, you have to when you blame them for the bad, you have to blame them for all the good that they do as well. I learned this from Tony Robbins in the uh, not I'm Not Your Guru. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that like, I'll say they they didn't do one thing. That brokerage didn't do one thing they said they were going to do, and it pissed you off to the point where you're just like, you know, screw you, I'm out. Well, you have to blame them for all the other additional things that they did do for you as well to help you become a better agent because they did employ your sorry ass. You know, they did give you a desk to sit in. They did give you people to be around. They did give you a support staff. They did, you know, probably put you through some sort of a training program. They did all of these things. So don't burn the bridges and burn, I mean, burn, don't burn the bridge or the boats off of one issue or a couple of issues. Try to work it out with them. But if you guys, this is the thing that, you know, Matt and I, what spawned, you know, the Getting Business Now program is that Matt and I had, I think, one of our only arguments in our business relationship of, I'm like, fuck you, Matt. You're like, fuck you, Greg. And we hung up on a Friday, and I was just steaming mad over a subject matter. And I came back, and I and I looked at the, looked at the problem that Friday night, and I'm like, okay, I have two options here. Either I can be pissed and lash back out, or I can look at it as a growing opportunity and become better at my at, at the at the problem that we were trying to solve. I hit Matt, Matt back up on Monday. I'm like, dude, I came up with, I think I came up with a solution. This is the problem we we're facing. This is the solution that I think we can ha- come up with. And that is the Getting Business Now program, guys. Every, everything has a yin and a yang, a good and the bad. All right? Yeah. Look well, at that's... the good at all times. You know, look at the opportunity for growth. If you're not good enough, dude, you should be jump, jumping up and down for joy. This is an opportunity for growth for you. That's, this is when you can become an, an exceptionally good agent at that one thing. And then once you then master that one thing, then you can find the next fire and try to put that one out and fight that battle. But grow, continually grow. If you're not good enough, good. Celebrate it. Write all the things you suck at down. Take on number one. Beat it. Shut, cut it off. Go to number two. Beat it. Chop it down and keep going down the line, guys. Hmm. That's one thing that I, I really have been doing a lot in my own self. You know, just yeah. trying to become better better at yeah. things that I'm not good at, which yeah. there's a lot. Uh, no comment on that. I, and that's, <laughs> that's not the right strategy for everyone. But uh, yes, um, let me go back, go back to the original question, which is the, the whole issue with the brokerage thing. I think there is definite confusion with agents over what their broker is supposed to do for them, because ultimately when you're not doing enough business and people leave their brokers, it's because there's a fundamental misunderstanding, which is that your broker is there to provide you leads. And that's almost never, ever the case. Essentially, mm-hmm. your broker is there to give you a place to hang your license, and they're counting on you working your sphere of influence, your family, your friends, and, and so forth, to bring in, you know, best case scenario, somewhere between 5 and 10, 15 deals a year. That's where they make the most money uh, is off of agents that work their sphere. 
uh, and don't do so many deals that they can start negotiating down their splits, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, Greg, your your team probably doesn't make your brokerage a lot of money. Now it's a giant feather in their cap to have you on their team. It's great for recruiting because you are you put their name high on the list of you know the top broker, the top teams in the city and stuff like that. Um, but you probably don't make them a ton of money. Where they mm -hmm. make their money, their bread and butter is the average agent that does five to fifteen deals a year off of their sphere. So people have to realize that the brokerage is counting on you. They can't, they are not lead generating for you. You may work the front desk, they may have a website and all this stuff. Uh, and I'm kind of seeing this from the outside because my my girl, uh, Kristen, works at a brokerage now. She's doing graphic design and marketing. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't tell you that? No. Yeah. Good so that, that, that's, uh, you yes, yes, I will. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm I'm privy now to kind of it's interesting like I get to hear kind of the conversations or or what their what the brokerage's goals are uh for their marketing and stuff like that um and agents should realize where their brokers make money and their incentive is not to shell out a bunch of money to give you leads because here's the problem Greg what happens when you give an agent leads who didn't have to pay for them uh, Matt they're not going to follow up with them because they have no skin in the game I oh, am shocking. Shocked. What? Shocking. I for one clutch my pearls. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> so an old woman with like white gloves, like oh, no. Yes. yes. <laughs> clutch my but that, pearls. But that's why, and and that's what. So I think brokerages, brokerages themselves need to be very careful before they put a bunch of money into lead generating. Because Greg, you know this as well as I do. You had Mojo. You bought it with the team's money. You were spending money on Mojo, and did you make the calls? Absolutely not, Matt, for a good solid six months. Absolutely zero investment. And then all of a sudden my team's like, well, we're not gonna keep paying for this since you're not using it. I'm like, no, but it's it's a triple line dialer. They're like, congratulations, you can pay for it. So I did. And dude, guess what? Guess who sat down on Monday morning and started dialing? This dude. <laughs> It yeah, it's that, it is that way with follow-up because, I mean, you, you know this, Greg. You've said it a million times. When, when, when do most sales actually happen? How many calls does it take? Between the fifth and the twelfth contact with the client. That's where 80% yeah. of the sales live. And people yep. stop at level four and like, oh, they're calling me back. They're hurting my feelings, you know, because they won a trophy for everything that they do. I called them like one and a half times, and they didn't get back to me. Well, tough shit, okay? Yeah. Go cry somewhere else, buck up buttercup, you know, put your big boy pants or big girl pants on, get ready for rejection. But you know what? It's not always rejection. It's a four letter word that happens to all of us. Life. Yeah. Shit happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, let's say Matt was a, 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 a client of yours and you, you wanted to get a client, a hear back from him, you know, at the end of last week. Well, you, I guarantee you we're not going to get him because Matt was full in full, full motion of moving. 100% moving. You know what? So he's not going to call you back. He, you're just not top of the list. And if you called him twice over on, on Saturday and Sunday and he didn't get back to you, well, it's tough luck. Sorry. He, yeah, sorry. He had other shit to do. <laughs> you know, and that, that's the reality of it. I've had a lot of clients that I've followed up, followed up, followed up, and I stopped because I got my feelings hurt. I'm just like you guys. And then I'd call him back later, and they'd be like, oh, dude, hey. Actually, I had a guy, I had that guy, Mark, the, the guy from 2015, mm -hmm. the old curmudgeon. Dude. He thanked me. He's like, hey, Greg, thank you so much for following up with me. I really appreciate it. I'm like, hmm. what? I'm like, <laughs> okay. That's a woo. But, yeah, man, it's incredible. You guys have got to believe that and just understand that. All right. Yeah. Well, we were talking about this on the training today, just the, the meaning making machine, right? The part of your brain that's kind of always spinning and making oh, things mean cool. something tell it to like turning everything into a story. I, I dealt with a lot of this, um, in the, uh, shall we say the religious world mm -hmm. where they turn a lot of people turn their own personal experience into a doctrine that they then teach other people as if that was the truth for everyone else. Uh, your brain is constantly doing the same thing. Your brain is looking for, it's turning facts and then it's turning facts into meaning, right? So mm -hmm. I call three times or I email a couple of times and I text and person doesn't call me back. The brain is going, the brain is taking those facts and then creating a story behind it of they looked at my email and they went, oh, I don't want to talk to that person. Yeah. And like <laughs> throw the phone away. Um, and we, and your brain fills in all those gaps with a story that may have no resemblance to actual reality. Zero zilts, not a nil. Absolutely nothing there, guys. It is a donut hole of reality. You know, don't put, don't put stock into something you don't have verifiable truth to. 
All right. Yeah. You know, it's just it, it's just a, I think it's a horrible way to go. I like, you know, the, the old saying trust, but verify. So, you know, you believe that, you know, you believe that they don't like you. Well, verify it. And if they verify, you know, if, they, if you verify that they don't want to work with you or that something has changed. Great. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Peace, Ninja. I'm gone. I got other people to work with. Heather, what's up, by the way? Glad that you're here. Yeah, Heather Windsor. Absolutely. Thank you for watching. And, and yes, the, the, the moral of the story is follow up. I would like to point out one, maybe taking that step one, one more further, which is this to have the ideal is to have a system. And even, even I don't have this yet. So I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody, but so, so like I have a, I have a pretty good system for like generating cold leads for my business. Cause, um, the act of booking people on podcasts just kind of naturally uncovers opportunities for people that are interested in starting their own podcast. Right. Right. So I have a, I have a systematic approach that I can scale up and down that will uncover opportunities for my business. What I don't have is I don't have a systematic uh, approach to following up with them over time, other than me continuing to book them on other podcasts and just make introductions and connections. It's something that's still kind of like a mental burden on me mm -hmm. where I have to try to kind of keep track of all the different opportunities or I have to force myself to like sit down and actively mentally engage and look over all these relationships that I have and look over like some of the connections for ways that I can add value to people. Right. So I need to like, I have to turn that into a system. I have to turn that into a systematic way. And once I have a system, then I don't worry so much about the meaning. If somebody doesn't get back to me, they don't re respond to an isolated email. I just keep rolling with the system, the system, the system. Like that's what kind of keeps you safe from that meaning making machine, right? So Frank and viral marketing is a great example of this. They have an outbound follow-up team. They don't care about the meaning of the, the fact that the last person, you know, they called five times, hasn't returned their call. Don't care. They have a system, they follow it, they execute the system, and out the other side of the system comes a bunch of clients. Like that, that's kind of kind of the ideal that we'd like to get to. It's definitely the ideal for me. Yeah, I would completely agree with you. But sorry, man, I got to rub your nose in it like a, a human rubs a dog's nose in, a, in poo on the, on the carpet. No, you, no, no system. <laughs> you don't have a system for something? And mm -hmm. oh, man, that is just music right. to my ears. And you know what I did, at Wayne, Wayne Salmon style? I freaking hired somebody. <laughs> so I hired, uh, I hired my uh, guest booking specialist yesterday. Uh, this guy's name is Nick. He's from Omaha. But he is traveling all around the world right now. He is in Vietnam for the next what? month or so. He's on a special program uh, by, uh, that was started by the founder of Airbnb. So he's on – he's literally spending one, one month each for the next 12 months I've heard in a it. Southeast Asian country. Yes, yeah, they'll work work abroad or something like that. And you, it's a whole group of people, and they go, they go work all over. The, they, you know, for a month, they stay in different cities. Yep, I I heard of that and I saw that. I'm like, hmm, I think real estate might suffer if I do this, but podcast. I think it was. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but yeah, that's, so that that's what he's doing right now. So he's doing that, and then he's going to work part time for me. Um, you know, reaching out and booking people onto all of our podcasts for you know for real estate, not necessarily for real estate and sensor. We don't need that as much. Yeah. So you have people reaching out to us, but for the other podcasts that I run. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing is like, like my whole goal is like, I figure out how to do something and then I figure out how to get myself out of it as quickly as possible. I mean, that's, I learned that from, from Frank and it's not just about not doing the things that you hate to do. It's about the, the only, there's only money in it. If you don't have to do it yourself, if you have to do it yourself, all you build yourself is a job. You Shit. haven't built more. Well, real estate, we guess guys, we all have jobs. Um, but Clifford, I'm glad that you're here, my friend. And Alex, way to go, dude. Matt, he got a listing closed an appointment uh, from 900 days ago. Goodness. Holy criminy, bro. That is ball up, man. Excellent <laughs> job. <laughs> now, unless you talked to them 900 days ago, didn't follow up, and they looked you up in like online or something, then <laughs> then maybe, I don't know, just saying, just putting that out. <laughs> <laughs> and it was disregard him, Alex. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking over, Greg. Who was it? You, uh, oh man, somebody came back to you after like 18 years, mm. and it was nothing that you did. It was just the fact that you were putting out videos or something 20, like that. 25. Tw what? 20, no, so, no, it was your first. It was it was oh, a referral my, from your first client. This is like 18 years ago, 15. Yeah, years Jonathan. Ago. Jonathan Smith referred his brother Joshua Smith. <laughs> 
uh, to me, and Joshua Smith got cold feet. Damn it! But oh, I am still following up with him. Was we'll see those damn cold feet, man? They're like they're like concrete shoes. They just sink to the bottom and just dash my heart. You know, mm -hmm. my all my feelings just go mm -hmm. by my eyes. Make sure you want to smack the bottom of those feet with like ping pong paddles, but I think that's considered torture technically. <laughs> <laughs> but never in the same place, all over the place. So you never do any damage. Oh, that's right. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, if you would like, um, if you would like to interact with me and Greg directly, God help us all, um, you can do that on uh, on Rockstar Prospecting and the upcoming Get Now Business class. So all of our live training classes, uh, we're going to start doing these on a on a regular basis. So we really are really enjoying like the format of like getting people together on a Zoom call and like interacting directly with you guys. Um, you can be on video or audio only, so there is that misunderstanding. You can just dial in if you want to just talk. Um, we had one of the students in the class um, Monday, Monday when we do the class, it's the only day that she takes off of uh, like getting up early with the family. So she would like to take the call from bed. Um, she did not realize the first class was broadcast in video. Uh, and was in bed. So we gave her a hard time about that, but if yeah, you're we worried about being on video for some similar reason like that, um, then uh, just keep in mind you can always dial in, you can interact with us, and just like a just like a, like a tele tele seminar or something like that. So go, go to rockstarprospecting.com, check that out. All right, dude, Chad, you pimp, sweet, dude. First day mojo out there, got four leads, one with multiple properties, guys. Doing these calls is not bad. I'm hearing from more and more people as it cascades in more faster and faster. That you guys are watching me do my live prospecting. You're all actually watching our show here. What we're putting out there is, you know, inspiring you guys to get out and go do the stuff that everyone's always been told you not to do or you're afraid of doing. You find out that it's actually not that bad. I'm so proud of all of you guys. You guys are an inspiration to both me. I know you're an inspiration to Matt. You're an inspiration to, you know, for us to continually put perpetuate the show, perpetuate the, the classes we're doing, you know, the courses we're doing, you know, if you guys have topics that you want to have covered in a, a workshop, you know, a 90 minute workshop that Matt and I will record um, or with a, with a, with a special guest and, or another course Matt and I can put together and you guys can interact with us. Something that, that, that's at it kind of like burning for you. Just like, tell, oh. just tell us what your biggest struggle is yeah. and, and for crying out loud, put it in the comments right now. Um, we yes. maybe not might not be able to deal with it on this episode because we're gone in three minutes. But but I, yeah, like we want to know genuinely like what you guys are struggling with. Obviously, we're not we can't talk to everybody one on one as much as we would love to. Um, so like the, the only way for you to get that feedback up to us is just you got to speak up, let us know because we'll bring in if it's not something that we are we would consider ourselves experts on. Guys, all we do is we get pitched by people to come onto the show or we reach out to people to come onto the show. We run so. into the highest level people on the planet sometimes, not just in real estate, but guys, we've got like Chris Voss, the FBI hostage negotiator coming on the show next month. We've got one of the co-authors of Traction uh, and Rocket Fuel coming on the show next yeah. month. We've got guys that are like the, the director of sales nationwide for Summit Funding, big mortgage company. I mean, we've got some really high level people coming up. Um, and so if we're not experts in the subject that you guys are struggling with, we can find those people and bring them in for trainings mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and do it for free. Uh, so. Uh, no. Judy says, great webinar this morning, very informative and helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judy, for uh, for coming to that. Um, yeah. That that was this morning's um, Introvert's Guide to Real Estate Success, if anybody's listening or watching later. But anyway, Greg, they should they should do something on social media to connect with us more deeply. They should stalk the shit out of us. Follow Maybe us. Maybe not that. How about just follow us? <laughs> Okay, just follow us. Not in person, that's weird. But follow us online, guys. You know, follow us on Facebook. Make sure you're seeing what we're doing. You can go to Pursuing the Results on Instagram and see Matt, what he's doing on Instagram. You can go to McDanielCallahan.realestate on Instagram and follow my Instagram account whenever I remember to post anything on that thing. Um, but I am going live on Facebook all the time. I'm always posting something, either inspirational or videos or whatever else. But if you don't follow me, because you can't sure shit can't friend me. Um, you know, Facebook is a dick. Oh, the only Facebook allow, black hole. You only allow 5,000 friends. I mean, how antisocial is that? And more importantly, Gosh. when you friend request Greg and he cannot accept, it does not automatically convert that into a follow. I think it just mm -hmm. goes into the black hole. Goes into the black hole. Guys, I mean, this is this is how many people have gone into the black hole. 941 as of today. Black hole. Big big party down there, but not too much fun. You know, so follow, 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 follow. And then, guys, please know our love for you is deep and it is true. 
We truly believe in the people that watch the show and share this show because the people that do are truly authentically trying to make themselves better, not just giving the world lip service like, oh, I'm going to be a great agent. I'm going to do all this. Fuck you. No, you're not. You're just going to waste my motherfucking time and just waste my and waste the air around me because you're just a waste of space. So stop talking and start acting. And the people that are here, you guys are amazing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And uh, you guys definitely are uh, people that are looking to improve themselves and actively out there looking for information on how to be a better agent. Sadly, you're in the minority. Um, <laughs> when I walk into, uh, I've walked into some brokerages and run across some agents in my day, and uh, you ask them what you know, do, what what kind of real estate podcast do you listen to? God, you remember Greg when we were at the the uh, California Association of Realtors Expo, and we mm. just asked people like, hey, you know, what do you uh, what do you listen to or what do you watch, to, you know, to learn how to be a better agent or like improve your business. The number of dumbfounded stares we got was disturbing. Just Pod disturbing. What? 90%, 90% of people had no idea what we were talking about. And I'm not talking about like knowing what a podcast is or how to download. I'm talking about going after any educational information of any kind. At all. At all. At all. And that is skills of the people you're doing business with. Yeah. I mean, come on. Give me a break, people. But Stefan, what up, player? Hey, dude, reach out to Matt about what we talked about uh, the other night. You know, see if we can get them, get you guys, get everybody together. Uh, Debbie, thank you so much. Thank Holly, thank you, Holly, for thank you for following us. Um, but Matt, we're over, bingo, bro. We got we got to rock out we got you. now. All right, guys. Yeah. Till next time. Peace out, ninjas. We love you. <laughs>